Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Alliance Bernstein. Since 2019, employees have impacted our community by giving more than 5,000 hours of volunteerism in Middle Tennessee. AllianceBernstein.com. Alliance Bernstein is not affiliated with National Public Radio. I'm Khalil A. Colota, and this is Nashville. Since Monday's tragedy at the Covenant School, messages of support from all corners of the country have poured into our city. Six people were killed, and our collective grief has only just begun. The only way to make it through a tragedy like the one we just experienced is together. We must talk with each other about how we're feeling to begin the process of healing. All of us have been impacted. Each of us impacted differently. So today we're making space to hear from you, the members of our community. We'll have faith leaders and counselors to offer help in how each of us can begin our process of grief. But first, it's time for Add Us. Each week, we take time to read the comments so you don't have to. Yes, I'm encouraging you to literally add us on Twitter at This Is Nashville and on Instagram at This Is Nashville underscore WPLN. Joining me now with a look back at the past week is our digital lead, Anna Gallegos Cannon. Hey, Anna. Hey, Khalil. You know, this segment is really like a highlight of my week and is usually fun and upbeat, but Mm -hmm. it's been really tough. And our feedback from our listeners really reflect that heartbreak. Yeah, this is this is a tough one. So Mm -hmm. where should we start? Well, let's start with the outpouring of support that came for Tuesday's guest, Anna Cottle. She joined us to share memories of her longtime friend, Catherine Kuntz, the head of Covenant School, who was one of the six victims of Monday shooting. Listener Alan Hall tweeted at us saying, quote, Anna Cottle, thank you for your honest, raw, vulnerable interview on This Is Nashville. Dr. Kuntz was honored, and I am richer for it. Listener Ben tweeted, quote, thank you, Anna, and This Is Nashville for telling the story about Covenant School and the imperative to act like human lives are more valuable than guns, end quote. Thank you for those messages, Alan and Ben. We also heard from many other listeners who were glad that Anna spoke directly to Governor Bill Lee and Senator Marsha Blackburn, both of which have connections to Catherine and the Presbyterian community, but had been totally silent after the shooting. Governor Lee finally released a video message a few hours after we interviewed Anna and published a story about it. Here's an email I received from a listener who asked to remain anonymous. They wrote, quote, I was relieved to see Bill acknowledge his connection to Cindy Peake and Catherine in his recorded speech. I hope those connections help hold these leaders to accountability and somehow give them the courage to embrace gun control, end quote. Um, I just want to add a note for listeners that Cynthia Peake was another victim in t- Monday shooting. And, you know, gun control is definitely something we'll hear about more mm-hmm. in the coming days. And we are working on an episode show On the topic, too. Now, throughout the week, we've gotten a lot of feedback on our on air decisions as Monday's tragedy unfolded. One listener wanted to know why we continued our scheduled episode on photography. That was actually a very hard decision to make. Mm -hmm. But for context, we found out about the shooting around 10 30 a.m. on Monday. While WPLN editors were confirming what happened and sending reporters to the Covenant School, there were dozens of behind-the-scenes decisions that had to be made, including pausing our spring fundraising drive. By the time we hit the airways at noon, we didn't have enough verified information about the shooting to put on a whole hour about it. Nashville police hadn't even held a press conference at that point. That's why we made the decision to keep with our topic as planned, but to start with an update from criminal justice reporter Paige Flager, who shared the few facts that WPLN was able to confirm by that point. We also provided another update with education reporter Alexis Marshall at the start of our third segment, and that was after the press conference took place while we were on the air. It was also not easy for our guests, who were also worried about what was happening. After the show, our guest L. Danielle shared on Instagram, quote, being in a news space as a local and national tragedy unfolds, we all sat trying to figure out how we were just going to talk about our work while families grieved just a few miles away. But days like this are reminders of how important things like family, joy, and memories are. And 
you know, I'm so I'm so sad that mass shootings have become the norm and our leaders won't change. But I am thankful that I can help bring happiness to people in this heavy, heavy world. End quote. We knew we wanted to do a full episode dedicated to the Covenant shooting and our community's response, which is what we aim to bring you this hour. But before we get to that, I also want to answer another question we received about quote-unquote, dead naming the shooter. Okay, so for our listeners who may not know, dead naming is when you call a trans person by the name they used before their transition. We've had many guests, and we have met many trans guests on our show and always respected how they choose to identify and call themselves. But this time, it was more complicated. Yes, there was actually multiple conversations about this in the WPLN newsroom because Nashville police named the shooter as Audrey Hale and said that they were trans and used he, him pronouns on a social media account. This is a delicate situation, and we decided to continue using the shooter's birth name only as attributed to the police. We are also currently following guidance from the Trans Journalists Association, which points out that once someone has died, you cannot easily verify how they identified All this is to say, if you listen closely, you should hear that on our show, we use the lead shooter's name and pronoun sparingly, and only as attributed to police, like I said. There will certainly be more information coming coming out in the weeks ahead, so, you know, stay with us for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that breakdown, Anna. Anything else this week? Yes. So before I leave and go back to my computer, I want to remind our listeners that we're hosting an event tonight at 6 p.m., It's a community conversation and dinner around our recent special, Alternate Endings, with reporter Ambriel Crutchfield and executive producer Andrea Tudhope. There are still a few tickets left, and you can find the sign-up link at WPLN.org and on our social platforms. And I'll be there, too. And listen, we all need community right now, so I am looking forward to it. That is our digital lead, Anna Gallegos Cannon. Anna, as always. Thank you for this roundup, and we'll see you soon. Of course, and our listeners know where to find me. And don't forget to add us on Twitter and Instagram. Let's keep the comments coming. Also, fill out our community survey to let us know what topics you want us to cover at thisisnashville.org. It's super easy and quick, and it helps us to produce shows with your needs and interests in mind. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll hear from you, our community members, about how you're reacting to the tragedy at the Covenant School. Join us and tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil Colonna, and this is Nashville. Last night, hundreds gathered at Public Square Park downtown to honor the victims of the Covenant School shooting. Cheryl Crow was there, singing, I Shall Believe. Among the attendees was 18-year-old Gabby Romo. She student teaches at an elementary school not too far from Covenant. And I went there today and it kind of just hit close to home. And I just looked at my students and just prayed that nothing like this ever happens to them. And I'm just sad that it happens at all. Addie Brew was there too. She's 16, a student at St. Cecilia Academy near Green Hills. I just feel so upset. <laughs> Especially for, like, the parents who lost their child. (laughs) Because I have a sister and I can't imagine losing her. I mean, I would be, my whole world would just, like, fall apart. It's okay. 
I'm just, it's just, this just, just not should be happening. I really want there to be better gun control. Like, I feel like that's a must. Because, right, it's just outrageous. I just, I don't want to be, feel scared going to school anymore and having to think about what do I do if there's a shooter that wants, that's like gonna come in and where do I go? And I'm tired of living in fear. Six people were killed at the Covenant School on Monday. Three children, Evelyn Deakhouse, Hallie Scruggs, and William Kenny. And three adults, substitute teacher Cynthia Peak, custodian Mike Hill, and the leader of the school, Dr. Katherine Kuntz. I'd like to introduce my first guest. Dr. Christina Edmondson is a psychologist who works at Koinonia Church. Dr. Katherine Kuntz, worship there. Dr. Edmondson, thank you. Very Thank much you. for Thank being you. with us today. Now, you and your congregation, you, church members, you lost a member of your congregation, and I want to express my, my deepest consol- condolences to you. All. Thank you so much for that. Uh, she and her family had just begun over the matter of a few months of joining us in worship, mm. but she already was making her impact, uh, just a very bright light. I understand you and Catherine, you spoke on Sunday. What did you talk about? Uh, we talked about leadership <laughs> is mm. what we talked about. And um, and to be frank, I, I had not had many conversations with Dr. Kuntz. Um, I knew many members in our congregation who knew her quite well. My husband, who is the lead teaching pastor of the church, had talked to her and her dear husband um, other times. But that was one of my first in conversations with her was just Sunday. And uh, she talked to me about her work um, she talked to me about the importance of leadership. It almost seemed surreal to me that we were having this conversation in the middle of the lobby mm-hmm. as people were walking around leave, leaving the service. And um, and she mentioned wanting to connect for lunch and um, text, text me that day when I got home uh, from service and had given me her number and her husband's number, which um, is why I was able to reach out to him immediately is because she had given me that contact information. But she talked about her role as a leader and... Um, Her role as a leader as a woman, also in spaces where uh, people didn't always give her the respect um, or understand her her work. I think her quote was, they don't really know what to do with me. And I kind of chuckled like they need to let you do what you do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And so I wasn't I wasn't surprised when I learned the sacrificial way that she showed up on Monday Um, because I knew that she was a leader among leaders and um, took her role to be one in which uh, it was her responsibility to do whatever she, whatever she could do to care for the children in that school. What do you think attracted Catherine to Koinonia church? I I, I don't know. I wish I could have asked her that question. That would have probably been something we talked about at lunch. And I, and I lament not being able to have asked her that. And I, she was a woman of of great opinion. So I know she would have told me the real story. Um, I I would imagine uh, uh, we are a a fairly young church, only a couple of years old, but we do attract people who um, are, are service minded, who have kind of a vocation of whether it's social work or, um, education, people who who long to see justice done, but want to know how their faith informs justice and want to have a place where they can be encouraged and inspired through the week so they can do the the hard work Monday through Saturday. Mm -hmm. And so I imagine that may have been why she found herself there. There was a young woman at our church who she had a very close relationship with who I found out later had invited her. And Mm so um, that was the connection point. So how's, how has your church community, how have they been impacted by this tragedy? So I think uh, just like many of the, the people in Nashville, um, they are heartbroken. Um, people are, I think, moving back and forth between a deep sadness and fear and just an anger. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, the kind of how long and how could this have happened, those types of questions. I think our uh, people are, are wrestling with, which are good and fair questions to have. Uh, in our community, we gather together virtually on Monday night just to have a time of crying and praying. And uh, having talked to Richard Coons, Dr. Catherine's husband, uh, he emphasized to us the importance of making sure that we prayed for the seven families who are now changed forever. And that would also include the family, uh, the Hale family, 
mm-hmm. the shooter's family. Um, and so I'm grateful to uh, worship with the type of people that even in the midst of their suffering, um, say, don't forget about everyone. Um, so that's we've been trying to walk together and to treat each other kindly day by day. Now, we got a voicemail from Shelby Slowey, who is pastor at United Methodist Church in South Nashville. She also has three young kids, and she says when this happens, it spurs difficult but necessary conversations about what to do if a gunman shows up at her son's preschool. Let's listen. The mental gymnastics required for that creates a sense of cognitive dissonance so profound that it makes me question what has always been a sincerely held belief, which is that people are generally good. Because if people truly were generally good, how are so many good people absolutely convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that their right to have a gun is more valuable to them than the life of my child? Dr. Edmondson, what's your response to that? I think that's a a strong and a fair and a necessary question. And I think as a person of faith, there is enough grace for us to ask very honest, hard questions uh, that we should not fear them. And I would also say, as a person who has a social science background, that while it may seem like there are many people who take that position, the, the data shows us actually that most people want uh, gun safety. So the question becomes... Why are we beholden to the the interest of a particular group with the money and the power uh, to speak for a nation um, who has a unique problem that no other nation has? Mm-hmm. Um, we are exceptional in the ugliness of this problem. So I I, I affirm um, what that caller has said, and I also want to add to it that um, there are many people who are quite frustrated, and that. Many of us feel uh, pressured into uh, this roller coaster ride of mass shootings that we would like to get off of. I'd like to welcome my next guests. Clemmy Greenlee is the founder of Nashville Peacemakers and Mothers Over Murder. She's joined by Sarah Amos, a clinical social worker and former school counselor. Ms. Clemmy and Sarah, thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Now, Sarah, you're a mother mm-hmm. and a counselor. What's this time been like for you? It has been a really difficult week on both of those fronts, for sure. Um, Holding space for all of the people in our community that are grieving, that we know individually, personally, and just that our whole city feels shaken and unsafe. And even on a personal level, taking my kids to school has felt very difficult this week in light of of what other parents are going through, Um, our neighbors, what, what, what they're going through having taken their kids to school. So... I say difficult is how it has been this week. Mm-hmm. Now, Ms. Clemmy, you've, you've been through this yourself as a mother who's lost three generations of family members to gun violence. Tell me, how did you, how did you react when you heard about what happened at the Covenant School? Well, first, my uh, reaction was screaming. It just started screaming. Um, that night, that Sunday evening, I had over 25 of mothers that comes to me that has their kids murdered every day. I called for emergency meeting because they were just feeling something. I don't know what it was, but mm. I called a meeting at a church and uh, all of us was there. And we, it was just so heavy. Everybody was heavy. And um, we ended up doing about four hours and we was able to laugh ourselves out the church door and go home. Then to wake up Monday morning and see that, it devastated me. It I wanted to immediately run to the mothers of those families. Uh, I even say the mothers of the three adults, whether they mom's still living or not, I don't know. But still, I, I just want to grab them and, and hold them and love them. Um, pain is pain. I don't care where... It happened, what happened, who done it, how many was killed at one time or just one person every day. This 
whole city, no, this whole state of Tennessee should be in mourning and ready to come together. Uh, no pointing fingers, no blame game. Just let this come, right? All of us together. Um, everybody was calling me this morning, uh, asking me about coming to the Capitol, to the Cardale Hill building with the students. I want to say to them, I am so proud of them. They showed up at the Cordell building in Capitol. Right now, they're up there, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them. And this is what it's going to take because I don't know I don't know how to say this, and I don't know how to feel with it other than say it. Every single day, we fear our kids' life in my community. Every single day, we have a murder in our community. And to wake up and hear this for little kids, we had some time with our kids. These was little kids. Mm -hmm. That we have to figure out how can we bring this together with that and we all coming in for this gun violence. Because we don't we don't get any recognition. You know, we had over 13 murders and just passed last month and nobody talked about it. So if this right here, what it took and what it's going to take to bring all of us together, every one of us, I don't care what color or background you come from, I'm open, I'm ready. We have to fight this law. We have to do something about these guns. We have to. Thank you for that, Ms. Clemmy. We got a voicemail from Erica Duke, who's in her 30s and just moved back to Nashville to go to college. Let's listen. I think about feeling like a sitting duck in school sometimes. I thought about this Monday morning, ironically, before I heard about the shooting. Just a random kind of claustrophobic thought of there's no way to get out of here if I need to. Also, being in my 30s, I think about the possibility of starting a family with my husband in a few years but how would I do that here? Why, why would I do that here? In this country where we seem to be okay with the fact that children can be murdered with military weapons while they're at school, there's no logic to the reality of gun violence in America. There's no peace. There's just heartache. And Ms. Clemmie, you, you, you just talked about that. You just talked about the reality of gun violence that we face every day, that our children face. And you talked about how certain communities face it absolutely every day. What else do you want to say about this reality for everybody listening? You know, I, I want to say to the lawmakers, you know, are you going to wait till it hit your school where your kids are at? that you really shut this law, this gun law down. That, that, that lady, she, I mean, no kid have no reason, black, white, Puerto Rican, I don't care. You have no reason to fear school. You have no reason to, you, you're so traumatized now. You even hear the cafeteria door shut. Everybody finna jump. And it's not fair. Um... I just ask that we all come together. We come up with a strategic plan, a strategic plan. We take back to the law, lawmakers ourselves. I don't think the lawmakers, even Governor Lee, and I don't get into politics. I just don't. Mm -hmm. I think neither one of them should be able to make another decision, go to work, type up any kind of bills until they hear from us. Um I'm I I'm, I'm really want to help the students stay in there for the whole month of April where nobody can come in and make any kind of decision. They are still, we had one, I saw it myself, so I'm not quoting what I uh, heard, that one politician said, but just think if the teachers had had, had guns in their hands, none of this would have happened. Mm. So yeah. you still, after this, got a heart to say that. And, and I understand what you're saying, but, you know, we had, we had this quote from Shannon McDougal, Dougal, who says that she's sad, angry, helpless, and defeated. It, it feels like when politicians have reactions like that, 
um, some of the more uh, notable reactions from some of our congressional delegation has people feeling defeated as if there's nothing that we can do. What do you have to say to Shannon and everyone else who's feeling down as if um, we're lost in this maze of tragedy? See, to me, politicians, they bully us. You know, it's the same thing as bullying little kids in school. This is what they just done. They, they're bullying us with these gun laws. We have to bully them back. And the only way we can bully them back is to stay in their face. We can't let this blow over. The Waffle House blew over. The 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 Bennett Church uh, that just happened blew over. All the shoot, mass shootings and the one-on-one shootings, they are blowing over after what March, April the thirtieth or April the fifteenth. We'll, we'll be talking about something else. Going back to work with a cup of coffee. Mm. That's got to stop. We have to stay consistent at that Capitol and in their face. That's the only way that we're going to change this. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Kali Olekalona. We're talking this hour about how our community is responding to the mass shooting at the Covenant School Monday. Join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. Now, we received a comment from a parent of a third grader who attends school a few mm. miles from Covenant. He writes about what happened when he picked up his son on Monday. He says, quote, as we were driving home, we talked, and he corrected me when I called it a lockdown. He calmly explained a lockout is when a person is outside of the school, so we have to lock the doors and cover the windows. The lockdown is if someone is entering the school, and that's when we have to be very quiet and hide behind the wall of bookshelves. It broke my heart. Why have we accepted this as an everyday part of elementary school? More scrutiny of school security more student drills and training teachers are not solutions and they don't address the problem but i know those will be the solutions that many folks suggest and it breaks my heart end quote sarah as a parent and a former school counselor what's your response to hearing this it's heartbreaking to hear a third grader with that level of not just detail, but experience. He's practiced those drills. He knows what to do. And on the one hand, it's encouraging that we are learning from each tragedy how to protect a little more, but it's not, these are symptoms of the problem. They are not the problem. So um, yeah, as a, as a parent, it's, it's really scary about what my kids are going to be learning in school. As a former school staff member, I've been through these drills. I've participated, I've been a part of, lockdowns and lockouts both and it's really scary to walk through as the adults in the room with the children and and I think from a mental health perspective a healthy version a healthy way to navigate this is to let them know this is not normal this is not okay this is scary for us it's scary for you not to normalize the fear but to normalize the experiences that we have we don't have to adjust there's fighting to be done but also I get why you're scared. I get why this is confusing. You know, each of us is affected by this in different ways, but we all have been affected. I don't care the neighborhood and where we live. I mean, last night I was having dinner to celebrate a friend's birthday and I was apologizing to a 15 year old for what we have let go, what we have allowed to continue to happen. Many listeners know that I was a former educator and I taught elementary school. Mm -hmm. Nowhere close did we have to do these things when I was in school, nor for these kids who are in their mid thirties at this time. And, you know, I'm just thinking, Miss Clemmy, we're here at this point in our country again with another mass shooting, with more little children the same age as my nieces. What can we do? What can we do to organize, to get ourselves together, to get in the face of the lawmakers who are obviously refusing to do anything? You know, I was reading something about 1968. Um, it was 34 million guns already out after the death of Martin Luther King. And I felt then that if, if they knew that was that many guns there then, so the politician, the lawmakers, period, was already... Um, galvanizing to see this point to come. I asked a lot of people, especially churches, mm -hmm. we got to quit praying about it. We got to quit going to the altar. We got to quit laying hands on people. And we got to get on our feet and we got to take some steps and we got to clam them steps. And we have to start our own petition. 
We have to start our own voting. We have to talk to our people in our own families. Even though I have a bunch of friends that that's privileged, I have a bunch of friends that their parents are, are rebels, or I got a bunch of friends that their parents Ku Klux Klan's. But I tell them, we can't change them. You guys is the one that have to go talk to them and tell them that this generation didn't do nothing to you guys. And y'all didn't do nothing to this generation. Now, I hate the ancestor stuff that happened. But this right here, guys, we all, every single one of us, have to come together, every church, every school, every organization, every household, every neighborhood. I was somebody asked me this morning, so well, so what's the difference between Brentwood and the hood? Now it's no different. It's pain. We bleed red. We talk the same language. I don't nobody's money bigger than anybody's money when it comes to everybody gathering out here at the Covenant School last night. Mm. Everybody of every color was on their knees crying. So the number one thing to me is everybody have to get in the room together. That's what's wrong with us now. Everybody is separated, doing separate things, and they know it, and they know, they know we're not going to come together. The Million Man March, okay, here we go, right here. And every color it is need to be in it. Dr. Emerson, on that note, how can this you know, bring neighborhoods, religious communities, people who don't attend, attend church. How can this bring all of us, the people of Nashville, Middle Tennessee, as Miss Clemmie says, the entire state mm -hmm. together? Yeah, I mean, all people who value human dignity in life, whether they are people who ascribe to a particular religious tradition or not, we are um, interdependent and interconnected, whether we like each other or not. Mm -hmm. These are just the facts. Uh, I need my neighbor. Um, and it would be helpful for me to love that neighbor that I so need. Um, and so I do think in the midst of this type of, and it's a very real tragedy and suffering, there is an opportunity to come together, as was just shared. Uh, and I think there is a, a necessity to come together. Um, the, the fact that we are so divided, the fact that the nation is so politically polarized, um, and that there is so much strategy um, and, and a misuse of psychology um, as a psychologist to get us to continue to be polarized mm -hmm. is designed so that we don't do the obvious basic next steps to fix this issue, to fix this problem. And so uh, a as I listen to uh, some of the politicians and others um, who don't want to have this conversation about gun safety, Every time I hear them, I'm like, oh, these are the well-funded NRA talking points. I'm, I'm hearing them again. I feel, like I, I feel like I know what they are, what they were given this week. I, told, I feel like I know what they were told to focus on because they play into these dynamics of polarization. Let's, let's dehumanize the shooter. Uh, we have specific language we're going to use about that. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's emphasize how we need to put more money in the safety of the school and arm our teachers. So these are talking points, um, and they're designed to distract but we need to have a talking point that's true and greater, which is that we can stop this and we must. I, I, I understand what you're saying about the, the time and the need for us to come together. But to your point, what you just made, I'm wondering when we, we will find the, the desire to yeah. come together as a community. Now, one last bit before we have to move on in the show. We have a voicemail from Allison Garber in Nashville, whose daughters are the same age as they killed, killed on Monday. Let's listen. I was grieving all day, but then I was... I realized how furious I was. It's not just a light level anger. It's a deep, um, a deep anger that nothing's being done. And this has been on repeat, but it got me thinking, how can I, as a mom and a citizen, do things like what can I do to make a change? So I've started to look into organizations who are already doing the work of trying to end gun violence. Um, we need to get rid of assault um, firearms and there, there's more regulations that need to happen. But my question and my, like what I'm wondering is what can I do as a citizen that wants this change when politicians aren't willing to take the steps to get the stuff done? I feel like 
I feel powerless, but yet I'm trying to look for things that I can do. You know, we hear a lot of this, the anger that about what's not being done. Ms. Clinic, could you briefly, well, where would you point out, uh, point Allison to? What are some of the organizations that she can look up to make this effective change? Well, see, the only, only organization that I'm going to say is mine's Mothers Over Murder. Uh, and the reason I say that is um, I've been everywhere looking for what I need to find out here for these other mothers, and I don't find it. I have groups that come together and meet, not just show up at uh, funerals, candlelights, and uh, politician uh, days. We have to sit and meet. So I meet three times a day, so I mean a week. So I'm going to say look up NashvillePeacemakers.org. Join me. And the best thing she said is find those that's out there that's already doing it so we don't reinvent the wheel so we can all organize together, school to school, neighbor to neighbor, house to house, church to church. So NashvillePeacemakers.org. Clemmy Greenlee is the founder of Nashville Peacemakers and Moms Over Murder. Miss Clemmy, thank you so thank much you. for being here today. Thank you for having me. Dr. Christina Edmondson and Sarah Amos will stick with us through the break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation about how the Covenant School shooting and its aftermath are affecting our community. We want to hear from you, so tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. We're taking time this hour to create space for you, our community, to express how the Covenant School tragedy has been impacting you. We know that everyone has had a different experience. We know that our collective grief has only just begun, but we wanted to hear from people who can help us to understand what healing might look like for us as individuals and as a community. I'd like to welcome my next guest. Reverend Don Bennett is past is the pastor developer at the Nashville Table. I'm sorry, at the Table Nashville, an LGBTQ plus centered church and is a former guest of the show. Pastor Don, thank you for thank being you so here much. with us Good today. To Dr. Christina Edmondson from Koinonia Church and social worker Sarah Amos are still with us again. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank now, you. Pastor Dawn, tell me your response when you heard about the shooting. My heart sank. My heart sank. Um, my heart sank as a pastor. My heart sank as a parent. My heart sank because uh, as the news continued to trickle out, uh, it became more and more dangerous for the people uh, of this city and particularly for folks in my community. And by the end of Monday night, uh, my phone did not stop. My email did not stop. And I've had uh, multiple vigils since then. I have um, uh, filmed, written quickly and, and filmed a trauma-informed pastoral care for other pastors and just push, push that out on the web because there wasn't time to train anybody. And I just, you know, the, the blowback is going to be fierce. And, um, and it has been fierce, and it's gotten more fierce by the day. Can you tell me more about trauma-informed pastoral care? Trauma-informed pastoral care takes a different approach. Uh, typical pastoral care often takes more than uh, one visit, and uh, and the and the the ongoing topic might be the same. Trauma-informed pastoral care uh, chaplaincy. Oftentimes, we have one opportunity to be in front of somebody, and uh, and their grief is real, their feelings are real, the panic, everything they feel is very real. And uh, trauma-informed pastoral care works to uh, provide safety first. Mm. Now, you said that your phone didn't stop ringing on Monday. Yeah. And, you know, we know as Monday went on, uh, the police identified the shooter as trans. Can you tell me how the members of your church were responding and what some of those phone calls were like? A lot of folks in my church are trans and... Um, a couple people in particular have not left the house since Monday night because they're terrified. That's their word, terrified. I call them and check in on them, and they, one 
person said, I'm absolutely terrified. And so I spoke to someone this morning and I said, it sounds to me like you haven't left the house. I haven't. And so, well, what do you have to do? Well, I have to go to the grocery. I have to go to the doctor this morning. And I said, well, you know, what's your safety plan if you're so terrified? What's your safety plan? Because you have to eat. You have to take care of your body. Mm-hmm. And um, people are terrified. And and the reason that is exacerbating this um, from an alarmist perspective is uh, the, uh, the, the news outlets are identifying uh, the first thing they say, you know, uh, the shooter is transgender. And that's what people hear. And so sadly, uh, the trans community is bearing the weight, the entire trans community is bearing the weight of one individual who perpetrated a crime who happened to be transgender, not because they were transgender. And the other uh, aspect of this trauma care that is very real is um, I myself have participated in, uh, in multiple uh, multiple vigils where we've lifted up the names of the people who lost their lives. But you know what? Aiden Hale lost his life. Nobody says Aiden. Everybody says Audrey. Everybody says a 28-year-old transgender woman is the shooter. But Aiden Hale's life matters. And there's things that went unattended to, and nobody lives in a vacuum. This situation didn't start on Monday. Mm-hmm. It started a long time ago. We, I want to share a message that we got from Sarah C., who writes, I feel, quote, I feel anger, frustration, and deep sadness. As a queer person, I'm also fearful of existing in Nashville. Before information on the shooter was even confirmed by local officials, right-wing politicians and talking heads on social media were blaming the entire trans community for the actions of one person. Just as the Nazis blamed tragedies on Jewish people, right-wingers are blaming things on trans and queer people. Their propaganda has already led to direct violence on LGBTQ communities, and their right-wing rhetoric will only lead to more violence and death. They wish to eradicate us, and this it's horrifying. This horrifying shooting is just the fuel they need to win people toward their hateful cause, end quote. Pastor Dawn, what's your response? <laughs> I have two uh, things to say. The first is that um, it is tragic and we are united in grief and we are in, united in grief for all people that are suffering. You know, um, Aiden's parents are suffering. They should not be criminalized. And I have a lot of thoughts about that for another day. But people who lose a child, no matter how old that child is, uh, Clemmy is a perfect example of, of a person who spoke about losing their child many, many decades ago. That pain, I lost my nephew at five years old, and that was 35 years ago. And my sister still deals with that. My family still deals with that. So the death of a child is permeates through the generations. And the other thing I would say um, from a pastoral lens, maybe perhaps even a, a theological scriptural lens, is that... Uh, there's a piece of scripture that says the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And the way that that happens is to create a distraction. So all the thief has to do is to create a distraction in the people through fear, through terror, through thoughts of violence. And then we will take it ourselves from there. And we see these things played out every single day in school shootings. We have two school shootings, almost two a day. Today's only the 89th, 90th day of the year, and already we're topping 130 plus shootings. Mm. Now, here's a message that we got from former teacher named Laura, who says her child had a panic attack in his school parking lot and couldn't go in after what happened on Monday. She says this is senseless and also that some of the backlash for our queer communities that we've been discussing is misplaced. Let's listen. Anytime someone else kills people, we don't say they're cisgendered. We're already attacking the trans community enough, and it's shameful. And maybe if we were paying attention to what's really important, like gun safety and health care and mental health care and education and housing and food security and all the things, then if we focused on that, then not only would the country be better, but the world would be better. So I just, enough is enough. I'm not backing down. Dr. Emerson, what can we do when people engage in reactionary violence? and scapegoating after a tragedy yeah. like this. It's um, it's infuriating and it's sad. I think it's also to be expected because this mm. is a, a long-standing pattern of distraction to not do the obvious, <laughs> the obvious. I mean, you, you can ask probably a group of nine-year-olds today 
and with their nine-year-old uh, hard-wrought wisdom through the tragedy of this incident, what should we do? My guess is those nine-year-olds are probably not going to say it was the trans people. Mm-hmm. My guess is those nine-year-olds are probably going to say the truth. Why are people able to access military-style weapons? Why does my teacher have to also, why is someone implying that she should also have a weapon on her as she teaches me? They have the wisdom that can lead us. And I, and I think we, we know better as well. So this pattern of taking a marginalized group, taking a minority group and using them as a point of distraction to increase polarization is kind of a thing that happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's devastating consequences on people's safety and also on this problem not being directly addressed as it deserves to be. Sarah, we've heard people that are experiencing so many different emotions right now. What are some of the ways we can begin to process this terrible, terrible event that's touched us all? Yeah, I think one one really important thing that people need to take hold of is that this is a process. This is, we are looking at a lifetime of healing for our city, for our community, and definitely for the families who lost a member of their family. This right now, what we're doing right now is the best first step coming together, hearing each other, supporting each other, praying. Even this conversation is the best first step. And for a lot of people that doesn't feel productive enough, we want to we want to know what to do. I've had a lot of conversations this week with teachers and moms and and people who want, they don't feel equipped to navigate the weight of this and acknowledging that and feeling what you're feeling, the fear, the loss, the anger, all of that is part of it. And, and also that's part of helping our kids navigate it, letting, normalizing our emotions, not hiding from them, not shutting them down mm-hmm. is the best first thing before all of the rest of it that's coming. Thank you for that. You know, I, I've got a question about how the c- Christian community is responding to all of this. A friend of mine is a very, very devout worshiper, and she's kind of questioning her fellow Christians. She's like, how can they consider a gun more valuable than a life? Dr. Edmondson, you know, how do you respond to somebody who is having their very faith shaken by event and events like this? Yeah, I would say I I have the same questions. Um, And I would say that that friend sounds probably a lot more gentle than me. I I think I'm more inclined to say, how dare you use uh, the the prince of peace, that's how we describe Jesus, as a justification for you to be armed as if you are a part of a group of uh, of people ready for combat. Um, It is a misuse of the faith. It is... Um, it is a sin against the third commandment, taking God's name in vain, using the Christian faith, using the God of the Christian faith in order to justify um, this bloodlust for domination and protection. And I think that friend is right to say, what does this mean? I, I would point that friend, though, to the actual character of the peacemaking Jesus is, is what I would do, is what I would be inclined to do. Um, and I think for all of us who are a part of different religious traditions or even within our families or whatever it might be, there are times when we, we have to sit with people's contradictions and hypocrisy, our own hip, internal hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this instance, I, I am looking to Jesus's directions and not necessarily the directions of those who claim to know and love him. Got about a minute left. Pastor Dawn, would you like to respond? Yeah, you know, last night at the vigil, one of the things that I said is um, Jesus was really good to say, I have sheep that are not of this flock. And there's been a time when all of us have been the 99, and there's been a time that all of us have been the one. And the reality is there was a time when all hundred of us were together and Jesus was there in the midst. So when we start fracturing apart, we have to realize that Jesus is going to go where everybody goes, not just with folks who stay, folks that go to the margins, um, because he is the Prince of Peace. And uh, he got mad. He, you know, he never got violent, though. Mm. He got mad, and, and that's justified. Uh, he also said the greatest of these is love. And, uh, you know, I, love comes in a lot of shades, and I, and I get that. Um, and rising up in resistance, that it also is a form of love. But we don't need to go to violence. Education, advocacy, those are the keys. 
I want to thank you all for being on the show. I want to thank my guests, Pastor Dawn Bennett at the Nashville Table, social worker Sarah Amos, and Dr. Christina Edmondson, a psychologist with the Koinonia Church. Thank you all for being here with us today. Really appreciate it. We want to thank everyone who tuned in this hour. Tomorrow, who were the early pioneers of hip hop culture in Music City? And what has the impact been? Well, check it out. This is Nashville is a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Our producers are Steve Harouche, Rose Gilbert, and Magnolia McKay. Our digital lead is Anna Gallegos Cannon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tutto. The masterminds behind our theme music are Lorange and Namir Blade. Special thanks to David Dark. The conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at this is Nashville. Find out on Instagram. Find us on Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil A. Colonna. It's time for all of us to be very honest with ourselves and each other. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody, and be good to each other. <laughs>